uh, about the role of Sea Grant in aquaculture extension. Um, I'm Maggie Allen. I am facilitating today's webinar and I coordinate the Kelp Network. We also have Brianna Shaughnessy on the line who is um, going to be helping facilitate and helping any tech or general content questions as well. She also works with me, uh, no education on aquaculture literacy. So just a few housekeeper reminders before we get started. Um, we know most of you are probably very familiar by now with virtual webinar platforms, but Adobe Connect is not the most common one used, we found, and it's far from perfect. So I'm going to just run through a few little tips. So if you've opened us, if you opened Adobe via browser, and if that's causing any technical difficulties, we may recommend reopening through the application instead which may require some updates or for you to download the application. So there should be a question that asks you which one you want to choose when you click on the URL. Um, apologies if that means you have to rejoin us, but hopefully that's not causing any problems. And if it's not, that's great. But we have found that sometimes opening it via application can cause less problems. Or if you're having trouble hearing us at all through the computer, uh, you can dial into the toll-free conference number that's listed on the screen there. Um, but if you do do that, please remember to mute your phone as we cannot control that. And you will remain muted uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat at any time and we will answer them after the talk or if they're very easy, maybe we can answer them during the talk as well. Finally, this webinar will be recorded. So if you'd like to listen to this again or you miss some of it or you want to share it with others, we're going to send out a recording shortly after this and it will be posted on our website. So just a really quick introduction about who we are and why we're here. Um, I know a lot of you probably know this information, but this webinar is hosted by the Coastal Ecosystem Learning Center Network or CALP Network and we're a partnership of 25 aquariums across North America coordinated by NOAA's Office of Education. And together we work to engage the public in protecting marine and coastal ecosystems. We started the Aquaculture Liter Literacy Initiative back in late 2017 with the goal to connect NOAA resources to aquarium visitors on the science of sustainable aquaculture. And the webinar series is just one of our activities. And we've actually expanded quite a bit recently with this initiative beyond the Kelp Network. And we now have this Aquaculture Literacy Community of Practice or COPAL. And we also have new mini grants uh, through that initiative, which we are super excited to announce um, now. And so I don't know if Bree, you have that URL prepared or I can paste it in afterwards, but we actually just pr promoted a press release recently um, announcing those mini grants. And so if you haven't checked those out, please do. Um, we especially wanna, help, wanna thank Mark and Chuck actually for their help with these mini grants as they really helped with the review process and just the entire process as well to fund these new projects. So if you have any questions about the Kelp Network, the Aquaculture Literacy Initiative, or anything else, please contact me or Brianna. Um, our emails are also in the slides there. If you'd like to learn more, join a listserv, anything like that, please contact us. All right, and with that, I'm going to introduce Mark and Chuck. Um, I'll give a quick bios and then I'll, then I'll stop talking. So as I said, we're really excited today to have Mark Rath and Chuck Weirich talk about Sea Grant's role in aquaculture extension outreach and education. Before joining Sea Grant, Mark Rath was the science coordinator at the NOAA Fisheries Office of Aquaculture. And then before that, Mark worked in several sectors of the aquaculture industry, including food and ornamental fish production, public aquariums, agricultural extension, and aquatic research models. He has a master's of science in aquaculture from the University of Maryland, and over the years has worked with many species, including but not limited to menhaden, oysters, clownfish, sea urchins, African clawed frogs, and zebrafish. Chuck Weirich brings decades of aquaculture science and industry expertise to Sea Grant. He's experienced in the culture of over 20 aquatic species and holds degrees from Texas A&M with a bachelor's in wildlife and fishery science, a master's in Texas State from, with, in biology, and a PhD in animal physiology from Clemson University. Before joining Sea Grant, Chuck was North Carolina Sea Grant's marine aquaculture specialist. And in 2018, he was a founding partner of the North Carolina Shellfish Initiative. He also played a key role in helping the state's shellfish aquaculture industry identify losses and receive assistance after the passages of hurricanes Florence and Michael. So with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to Mark and Chuck to talk about Sea Grant. Uh, 
looks like the wrong presentation. There we go. Yeah, thanks, yes. Maggie. Uh, so Mark and I will tag team this presentation, so we'll jump in and jump out as far as, as who's presenting uh, what slides. So, uh, so again, as, as Maggie mentioned, we'll be talking about uh, Sea Grant's role in aquaculture extension, outreach, and education. I see a lot of extension folks are on the call today, which is great. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we outlined the presentation today to provide a brief overview of Sea Grant. Um, Sea Grant's aquaculture portfolio, how we how we fund and our funding mechanisms. We also wanted to talk about the Sea Grant Extension Network and its importance, uh, and we'll conclude with a with a, a discussion of Sea Grant's uh, seafood resource education efforts. So first of all, a little bit about Sea Grant. So for those that of you who don't know or are not that familiar with Sea Grant, the National Sea Grant College uh, program was established by Congress in 1966. Uh, it works to create and maintain a healthy coastal environment and economy. That's the root mission. And we have 34 programs in there in all the coastal states as well as Great Lakes states and also uh, U.S. territories. So we serve a uh, marine, primarily coastal marine and a Great Lakes um, uh, with our mission. Although we do interact uh, with USDA and that will be continuing to support aquaculture as a whole um, going forward. So we do have four focus areas with Sea Grant and all the programs adhere to this. Um, some programs emphasize uh, one one focus area more than another. Some, um, <clears throat> some um, most of all, most programs are involved in all four focus areas. Um, so we'd have healthy coastal ecosystems, uh, another focus area is resilient communities and economies, such as working waterfronts. Uh, another one we'll be touching on this today is environmental literacy and workforce development. And finally, uh, the focus area we're, we're, um, we're involved with mainly is sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. So I'm gonna jump in now and talk a little bit about how we spend our money and um, specifically the aquaculture funding that, that Chuck and I are involved with. Um, but the main, the main thing Chuck and I spend our time on every year is the uh, NSIs, National Strategic Initiatives. And these are the, the large nationwide RFPs that, that a lot of you are familiar with seeing that come out from the national office. Um, the priorities for these are defined at the national level. They're deliberately broad in scope and large in, in scale. Uh, they're usually two to three year awards. Um, the amount of each award varies a lot from year to year, depending on what it is we're trying to fund. Um, and the priorities for those come from our strategic plan, which typically has about a scale of a 10-year uh, window for, for its vision. Uh, but we also get language in our congressional appropriations every year that we have to address. There's no such thing as earmarks anymore, but we still get notes from Congress about how they want us to spend our money. And the NSIs are one of the main ways that we sort of address those points. Uh, sometimes those come to NOAA in general and, and Sea Grant um, finds ways that we can touch on those and sometimes they're directly um, speaking to Sea Grant about how they want us to, to spend their money. But the real engine that kind of drives Sea Grant and, and makes it what it is and, and makes it unique is the state programs themselves and, and a lot of their money gets out the door through their omnibus funding um, in addition to the other research calls that the individual programs put out. And, and just by nature those are a lot more uh, regionally and locally focused, and those priorities are set by the programs themselves. You know, they work very closely with the national office uh, to, to set those up, but um, some of you might be familiar with those state-level uh, calls. We also fund a lot of fellowships. Uh, a lot of you might be familiar with the Canals Fellowship. That's kind of the, the big one, the flagship uh, fellowship program, where we place graduate students in uh, other offices around them graduate students that are nominated by the state program. So we place them in offices around NOAA, but we also send them to offices down on Capitol Hill to work with Congress directly. Uh, but we also have a lot more, um, more and more every year, it seems, uh, some targeted fellowships. And I'll talk about one of those specific fellowships later on. Special projects are kind of, um, one off is not exactly the best way to describe it. That makes them sound a little scattershot. But they're a little bit um, kind of quick turnaround, more, maybe more narrowly focused, maybe smaller scale projects that, that don't um, get included in the NSIs or in the state programs. We might have a need that pops up unexpectedly, or we might have a, a, small, a smaller scale effort we want to put out, and we'll just do a single special project competition for something like that. Uh, and partnerships are a big part of the way that we work. You know, we partner with other offices at NOAA, we partner with USDA, as Chuck mentioned, 
Uh, we partner with universities that don't have sea grant programs. Um, there's a, a tremendous variety of partnerships that we can we can use to leverage our funding and, and to um, kind of diversify what we do and get a broader reach with the money that we've got. I'm trying to use my keys, but I've got to click the button. There we go. Uh, in terms of our aquaculture portfolio, which Chuck and I are responsible for at the national level, um, Sea Grant's been doing this for a lot longer than, than just about anybody else uh, in the federal government, and, and definitely longer than anybody else at NOAA. Uh, we've been involved with aquaculture work for the last 50 years. Um, the technology that has been developed through Sea Grant funding has benefited not just the U.S., but um, aquaculture producers all over the world. And one thing that's a little bit tough uh, with Sea Grant is our funding has been variable over the years. Uh, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. We've been happy the last couple of years, that even though we've been getting zeroed out in things like the President's budget, Congress um, really likes our programs and really likes our work. And our, our stable, our funding for aquaculture has been pretty stable the last couple of years. It's been between 10 and, and 13 or 14 million dollars a year for the last several years. And it's nice to be able to have that um, stability and predictability. In terms of how our portfolio is made up, um, a lot of the work that we do from the national office comes out as research to support industry work and extension for business support. So making sure they've got the tools they need to do their work and to make sure that they um, can successfully plan um, a, a business and run a business once they get it off the ground. Um, training for safety, things like uh, workplace safety, things like seafood safety are a critical part of what we do. Um, talking a lot more lately about um, public education and working on perceptions of aquaculture and making sure people understand um, how the U.S. seafood system works. Um, we also do some basic research, you know, just the sort of baseline scientific research that that, um, that you see at every university in the world, right? That, uh, the sort of basic science that builds the foundation of some of these more practical things later on down the line. Uh, and, and research to operation, that's sort of the, the full encompassing concept of, of what we do. Um, we we'll start with the basic science and hopefully we can get that into the hands of people that can make use of it. Some of the recent funding that we've done, um, you know, COVID took everything over, um, even in terms of research funding starting a couple of years ago. We, we converted a lot of our research dollars into COVID rapid response, which you'll see there in that second bullet. But we still had some things in the fire that we kept on pushing and, and needed to get out the door because they were still important. Um, the addressing economic and market needs of the U.S. aquaculture industry is one that we're really, really proud of. It was a large-scale national competition just focused on economics and um, market needs. Not marketing, not promotion of seafood, but understanding seafood markets and understanding how to get um, uh, get you know, product from the farm onto people's plates. Um, we also ran what we were referring to as the aquaculture supplemental, trying to help build capacity for aquaculture work out in the state programs. You know, we get all this money from Congress. We like to push it out so that programs can apply for our grants. But if they don't have anybody on their staff that can focus on aquaculture and understands what to do with that money, um, then they're at a disadvantage. So we tried to uh, reward programs for building aquaculture capacity in-house. Well, that's what the supplemental was all about. Uh, in 2021, we tried a new type of partnership with uh, another office at OAR. We put a joint call out with the Ocean Acidification Program looking at multiple stressors of shellfish aquaculture. And one of the nice things about this was that it allowed us to reduce the match requirements for our grantees. Uh, we haven't mentioned this yet, but Sea Grant funding requires a 50% match from anybody who gets an award from us, um, which is a great way to, to get a lot more money involved in the projects, but it can be a real struggle for some folks to come up with that matching uh, funding. So if we partner with another office and they chip in some money, we can effectively buy that match down a little bit, which is really nice. Uh, we continue to put money into um, COVID responses. Sorry, I'm moving my slides out of um, And then we also um, partnered with another office at NOAA that works with aquaculture spatial planning um, to develop an, an extension position specifically targeting uh, the work that they do. So uh, the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science We'll be using this extension agent to help um, increase understanding and application of the specific products that they produce in that office. Uh, and that's what we're really excited about, and I hope that we see more types of kind of cross-line partnerships like that in the coming years. Uh, we're anticipating a couple more funding releases at the end of this year with our 2022 dollars, and we're not really allowed to say much about those until they actually go out. But um, I will pass it back over to Chuck for the next section. Thanks, Mark. Um, so um, I want to touch about and 
touch on uh, the Sea Grant Extension Network. Uh, and so I have a, a couple of slides here to try to try to explain this for folks that are not that familiar with what Sea Grant does. And so one of the things that Sea Grant has that can be very proud of is the vast extension network. And I'm going to focus on aquaculture, and we're we're using the term seafood resources more and more, not just aquaculture, but fisheries and 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 just to lump it all together, seafood resources. So these seafood resource specialists, these extension agents and specialists throughout uh, the U.S. and its territories. The main thing that people often overlook is they they do provide they wear many hats and they provide the what we like to call the the boots on the ground experience or support. Uh, they're intimate intimately involved with stakeholders, so they have the pulse of the industry, and so that's that's really one of one of Sea Grant's roles is to is technology transfer and basically bringing the information that's developed um, through research uh, down to the farm. Um, and, and, and getting it applied. And so that's, that's one of the roles uh, that, of the Sea Grant Extension Network with, uh, with seafood uh, resources. Um, one of the things I should mention and often overlooked is many, if not all, of our <clears throat> extension professionals are our researchers themselves. So they do a lot of applied research and so they're on the forefront of a lot of cutting research. It's not just transferring this research, it's actually developing and impl implementing the research and, and providing the, the results to the industry and, and other stakeholders, other coastal and Great Lakes stakeholders. Uh, so that's a very important role. To give you an idea of the, the breadth of the network, this is a little bit of out, outdated information. The survey was taken in 2019. Uh, next slide, please. It was taken in 2019 to see how many folks are involved in aquaculture. And this was this was primarily focused on aquaculture. We were, we we're doing another survey, or I should say, Ladon Swan, our aquaculture liaison at Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant, um, is is uh, doing another survey. We've had some recent hires in the extension network uh, through grants that are funded, that were funded, and so these numbers need to be updated. Um, <clears throat> but you can see that a lot of folks are involved uh, through different regions in aquaculture. But the FTEs are are down from that. So we have we have some folks that have say like 10 percent or 20 percent of their portfolio or less, and uh, that that's involved in aquaculture as, as per this survey. When others are almost you know, 80 to 100 percent aquaculture, but we do have some cross level. And again, we like to go by seafood resources now, but we do have some folks that bridge the gap between aquaculture and fisheries or work in both uh, work in both areas. Um, next slide, please. And one of the things we've done recently at the national offices, we've convened some regional chats. We first started in response to uh, COVID last year, and they were done every other week, but we've uh, moved them to once a month. And our primary, primary goal is to share information now uh, and, and also uh, provide some program updates, provide national updates, updates from the Law Center and others as well. And one of the topics that we discussed um, a couple of months ago, we, we started talking about aquaculture literacy or aquaculture education and what's really needed out there. And so we got a lot of different opinions and I kind of, we wanted to kind of focus them down. And the topics that were, that came up mainly was that the importance of K to 12 exposure to, to aquaculture and seafood resources uh, and and it came up a couple of times during our regional chats. Um, you can really create a spark of interest. It may not take with everyone, but it will. It would. It will take with with certain individuals, and that can be continued as as they they grow they grow older and and um, <clears throat> their interest develops. And um, and so so that's very important to create that exposure. And one of the other things that came up with there's many ways to enter this industry, aquaculture, as well as fisheries, and <clears throat> there's many ways to meet the industry needs. We, we, we brought up the point, or was brought up that a traditional way to to get involved um, in our areas is basically through a four-year degree or or more than that. 
but there's other needs of the industry. For example, the aquaculture industry and, and fisheries also needs a lot of trade skills. And so we talked about perhaps implementing programs, which there are existing programs at community colleges and Votech schools. It's very important. Um, and another thing that was brought up is internships and apprenticeships, whether or not that's part of a, a high school experience or a college experience uh, to get folks out on the farm or out on the water uh, working. It's very important, but what was brought up um, several times was the importance to have those subsidized or paid um, to be to be equitable for for all uh, to get involved with with interest. So so those are those are some of the things that were that's that's been brought up by our, our network professionals um, that we hope to We'll, we'll mention we'll mention a um, we'll mention it again as far as this presentation. It's areas that we need to expand on. So I'll, I'll pick up for the next couple of slides. The um, the next thing I wanted to get into was some of our um, more recent seafood resource education efforts, uh, and these are. Um, not really in any particular chronological order, but I'll start at the top. The Virginia Sea Grant Program um, just recently created an aquaculture research fellowship, and this is a this is one of the reasons I'm mentioning it is that we're hoping this will be modeled by other programs. Um, the awardee that they selected wound up um, being assigned to the Milford Lab up in Connecticut as part of the National Marine Fisheries Service, um, and they're going to be working on, on aquaculture topics there. But it's uh, it was you know, a really pretty smooth process to set up and we're excited about, about all the potential that it's creating for that individual and for the lab. You know, there's a mutual benefit there within NOAA um, in addition to the community where this person will be working. And we'd like to see that created um, at, at more than one program if we can if we can possibly make it happen. Um, I know all of, one, all of you on this, this call are probably familiar with the, the literacy mini grants that, uh, that Maggie mentioned up at the top. Um, this is the first time we've done something like this, or we were collaborating specifically on aquaculture uh, literacy. And Chuck and I in particular are really excited about these. Um, we're going to be looking to the results of these projects to help us set some priorities for our future national funding um, in terms of how we include aquaculture literacy in the calls that we build. Um, you know, will it be a, a specific liter literacy call? Slides rolling again. This is very mysterious. Um, you know, how, our, how our attention towards literacy gets, gets um, implemented, right? Is it going to be a specific call focus on literacy, or is literacy something we're going to be building in um, as a component to, to other topics? Um, the next one I wanted to mention to you all is a program set up by um, Hawaii Sea Grant. Um, this was sort of like what Chuck was talking about. This was focused specifically on K-12 aquaculture education. And they worked with teachers with some money they were awarded in 2019 to actually develop aquaculture curriculum, um, I believe specific to uh, the Hawaii school system, and then to implement it in the classroom. Uh, and then the last one is something that, again, Virginia Sea Grant put together called the Aquaculture Ambassadors Program. Uh, it was also a 2019 award. This is focused on perceptions and public understanding of aquaculture, um, ideally leading towards more public acceptance of aquaculture. And they, they identified four people that they hired as aquaculture ambassadors, um, they focused on training them with aquaculture skills so that they understood how the industry actually works. They trained them on business planning, which is something that the industry needs a lot. You hear a lot of horror stories about people kind of cashing in their retirement to open up an aquaculture farm and then it's gone uh, in you know, 12 to 18 months. Uh, so business planning is critically important. Uh, and they trained them on communication and outreach so that they could talk about what they learned, uh, not just with people in the industry, but with people in the community where those industries exist. Uh, so we're really excited to, to watch that program as it develops, as it, as it moves on. So uh, as our conclusions, um, I wanted to point out that less funding has been directed towards aquaculture education efforts lately, at least from the national office. I think it's fairly safe to say that's true at the program level as well uh, during the pandemic. Um, a lot of our attention was focused on keeping our industry stakeholders uh, literally uh, afloat, uh, keeping them in business and doing what we could to make sure that they were still here and able to be you know, part of our seafood infrastructure once this pandemic was over. Um, overall, Sea Grant's efforts are focused both on public education, um, I keep mentioning perceptions and understanding, as well as industry education, right? And we talk about best practices, we talked about building new technologies and getting them in the hands, in the hands of growers uh, to make their farms more efficient and more sustainable. And I've talked repeatedly about business planning. 
the National Office uh, funding has, we've got a couple of different masters, right? We, we always have to consider congressional direction, uh, but out in our programs, we can be a lot more regionally specific. Um, we see an expanding need to increase aquaculture uh, and seafood resource literacy, something that this audience, I'm sure, is very familiar with uh, in terms of how important that is. And it can be done at several different levels. There's not, um, there's not a single target for that effort. It's really broad. Um, and finally, our education efforts will um, translate to increased consumer awareness, understanding of where the seafood comes before it hits their plate, uh, and it will also uh, ideally in, uh, help support our industry stakeholders. And that's all we've got. I don't know if Chuck is still on or if his video just crashed, but um, we are happy to take any questions you guys have. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm still on. I have oh, some, okay, some, no problem. some markers in the so I was muted, yeah. But I'm, I'm here. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark and Chuck. Um, please feel free to type your question in the chat. Um, and we can get to them. And I know maybe Brianna also had some follow-up questions, so Bri can come off mute if she wants. Not to put you on the spot. Thank you, Maggie. I see someone's typing in the chat, so as they kind of gather their thoughts for their question, um, can you speak a little bit more about the National Extension uh, Coordinator position? Do you know um, like the timeline and some of the large scale objectives that might be interesting to this group? Yeah, that, that, that competition, it was, it was just uh, formally announced nationally. So um, the, the start date on that was projected for September 1st. So it, it worked out with that. I do know that the coordinator has already been um, been communicating with uh, the NCOS team, and so um, that will progress. Uh, um, the timeline I don't have, uh, in, unless Mark has it handy, but uh, that project will get underway. It's 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 started now, so so meetings will progress. Initial meetings this fall, um, and then it is a, a four year project. So, yeah, that's. Um, that award was uh, $600,000 over four years, and that's mostly going to support the salary for this person. But there is some programmatic funding associated with that as well. So um, Jim will have some, some money to actually do some work. There will be some additional funds and support from NCOS as, a, as that um, position really gets rolling. The, the main intent of it is to, to sort of translate and help apply the products that NCOS is developing as part of their spatial planning work that they do. So they focus a lot on um, identifying fit sites for aquaculture, and they also develop spatial planning tools to help people look at the coastal ocean and identify conflicts and identify um, everything you need to have to have a good site based on what you're going to grow and where you're going to grow it. So um, some of those are really technical uh, and having somebody in an extension capacity to kind of teach people how to use them and, and teach people how to interpret the results that come out of them is really, really important. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, I see that Sherry asked in the chat, um, how might the new strategic plan for aquaculture from the National Science and Technology Council affect uh, Sea Grant's budget for aquaculture? That's a good question. I can't speak to how it will affect our budget. Um, you know, the, the White House didn't zero us out this year. We had money not to do what we do in the President's budget. Um, we don't have a budget from Congress, though, and that's really what matters. So when the budget comes out from Congress, um, that's how we know how much we've got, and that's exactly how we know what we want to do with it. We always try to look at what the administration's interests were in the president's budget, even though it doesn't actually um, put any money into our accounts, um, because we're, we're part of the executive branch, and that's, that's important for us to pay attention to. Um, but in terms of you know, directly how the, the strategic plan will affect our budget, I, that's a difficult question to answer. But what I can say is we were involved, um, NOAA was involved, and then everyone that works at NOAA on aquaculture was involved one way or another in contributing to that strategic plan. So there are no surprises in there. And the things that we see as important um, in, in terms of priorities and in, in terms of new directions are very likely included in that, uh, in that, in that plan. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um... Joan Cox just asked, are there any good models for incorporation of aquaculture into future farmers of America? And this might be a good chance to plug some of your partnerships with USDA. Sure. Um, I'm unfortunately not familiar with Future Farmers of America, but I can tell you that we've got um, our eye on 
the Young Fishermen Development Act and a program that's part of that act called Food from the Sea. Uh, and so if you're looking for something like a model of how programs out there that um, is going to incorporate aquaculture into a larger piece of legislation focused on food or focused on agriculture, um, that's going to be a good one. Um, USDA has their own aquaculture portfolio. Uh, it's mostly focused on inland states and freshwater aquaculture, but that's still really large. I mean, the entire catfish industry is, is under USDA's purview, uh, and that's the, one of the biggest in the country. Um, so we, we work very closely with the USDA. We, we communicate with them um, regularly. We try to make sure that our calls, uh, if they don't overlap, we try to make sure that we're kind of working in conjunction with one another and always looking for ways to partner. Chuck, do you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, that's that's something that we can definitely expand upon um, um, as far as uh, working with USDA. That's that's great. That's a great comment there, Joan. Um, that's something we're we're definitely bringing up with them. That's a that's a logical fit from K to twelve through uh, uh, through an institution like uh, FFA. So so thank you for that, and we'll per, we'll pursue that for sure. I can hop in with more questions <laughs> for both of you. Um, so I'm wondering if if um, you were to pinpoint, you know, two or three topics that need um, some real help from environmental educators that are coming up as aquaculture uh, kind of expands in the United States. Are there uh, specific topics that you would that come to mind, um, or are those more kind of regional? Uh, I think one that is, is already got a lot of traction, but it's definitely needing a little bit. You know, it's, it's always going to need to be sort of repeated and, and um, restated. It's the a lot of forms of aquaculture um, have really clear and, and clear cut um, environmental benefits. Right, everyone's a little concerned about. Um, you know, pollution or escapes or, or other things they've heard in the media and asked me about aquaculture. Uh, and, and a good way to sort of temper those conversations is to talk about the good things that certain types of aquaculture can do in terms of nutrient reduction, in terms of habitat improvement, uh, in terms of attracting uh, other organisms, things like attracting fish to, to other areas or even attracting more plants to come in. You know, if you've got an oyster bank that, or an oyster farm that's cleaning the water, you you're, have a strong potential to see the return of things like seagrasses that might have been wiped out from eutrophication or, or um, you know, pollution running off from the shore. So there's a lot of good things that aquaculture does besides produce seafood that I think don't get enough attention. Uh, and, and that's a really powerful message that can, that can help persuade people to look at it a slightly different way. Um, that's a little bit more of a harder sell for things like open ocean marine aquaculture, but those, those types of operations do also have some environmental benefits. Um, you know, data is still coming in on, on how to quantify these things and, and how they can be how, how they can be used to the nation's benefit, uh, but not, there isn't a single form of aquaculture that has uh, no redeeming value. Right? They're, they're all uh, you know, complicated and complex, and they've all got things to uh, to be proud of once they're in the water. Yeah, yeah. I would add on <clears throat> as mentioned earlier. I mean, one of the things about increasing aquaculture literacy, and and I think that uh, the member institutions of Calc. I mean, that's a that's a great opportunity there to reach a lot of folks that might have misperceptions or just lack of knowledge on aquaculture going forward um, and how it can not just, as Mark mentioned, as be a source of food or other products, but it, in certain uh, cases, can benefit the environment, also coastal economies and communities and culture uh, going forward. So that story to, again, there's a lot of misperceptions out, out there, and it's just because uh, of the lack of literacy or the just the lack of knowledge, basic knowledge of aquaculture. And we do see, I think a lot of people's, um, their, their perceptions on that is tied in with, with, uh, with aquaculture and, and overseas, uh, that might not be uh, sustainable. And that message has been, uh, perpetuated and it gets to them, but we have a great story to tell. I think and it needs to be told, I think. Yeah, Chuck makes a great point about um, producing more of our seafood close to home. I think um, a lot of people don't think about how much of the seafood they might eat is produced on a farm somewhere, even if they have a, a negative perception of aquaculture 
showing up in their own coastal community. But um, I don't think it's a good idea for us to keep pushing our environmental footprint off into other countries that might not have the same kind of regulatory infrastructure that the U.S. has when it comes to protecting our coastal oceans, uh, but still allowing for um, shared uses. Right? So we can do aquaculture here in a smart and sustainable way uh, and ensure that the footprint that it does create is one that we can all live with. Um, one more thing I wanted to mention, too, is that, um, that I think it's overlooked in aquaculture for some reason. I still haven't figured out how or why. But um, when it comes to terrestrial agriculture in this country, that the family farm is, is revered. Right? It's, um, it's part of the fabric of our country. It's part of how we identify ourselves. Um, I think people need to see that the family farm also exists out in the water. These are working communities and working families, just like um, on family farms on land. And I think that's a really powerful storytelling and um, you know, sort of perception building angle. All right, thank you. So yeah, Terry has a question here. Um, has this recent research in increasing aquacultural literacy been incorporated into college coursework? Have you shared podcasts or other successful programs with schools across the educator network? Uh, I think when it comes to literacy being incorporated into college coursework, um, uh, there might be specific examples out there that I'm not aware of, but I think it's a little new. Um, I certainly think that there's you know, some literacy pieces that are ready to go and could be. Um, I, I can't point to any specific um, college curricula where they've included aquaculture literacy. But if anybody who can hear my voice that knows differently, please speak up. Um, same with podcasts. I think that that kind of thing is probably better answered by people from the network. And I know there are some of you on this webinar, so maybe you could type in the chat or Chuck if you know some. No, I was, I was about to say as far as uh, the first uh, question or first part of the question with in, incorporating the college coursework, of course, you know, aquaculture related uh, courses, that would be you would have exposure there, but, but broadly in other science or other biology courses or other, other courses for that matter. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't heard of anything yet, but that, that would be a good approach uh, there to, um, to bring up this topic. Um, but I would, I would uh, rely on our network here, our, our folks from the network, if they've heard anything about um, uh, the, the, the question about the part of the question about. Yeah, like I, I know there are aquaculture podcasts out there that the network and the programs have produced, uh, but I, I don't know specifically to your question, Terry, if they've been um, shared across the educator network. Right. Yeah, and I know, I mean, our, our aquaculture literacy grant program specifically targeted K through 12 and informal education. So they're all like um, not college coursework, but um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else on the call has any other answers to the podcasts or programs across the network. We have a couple other people typing, so. Maybe. I can, this is Brianna again, I can jump in with, um, you know I, know, I know that with all of the work that LaDon Swan has done with um, his aquaculture liaison position, he's been looking to better connect with groups like community colleges and technical schools. Um, those types of things are kind of, uh, with the pandemic, of course, we've been kind of uh, slowed down on our progress for creating new courses and new curriculum and things, but I know that um, better connecting with those types of university programs are, are um, at the top of, of the list of priorities for um, just kind of getting folks exposed to opportunities within the sector. I see a couple of people chat chatting potentially from South, uh, Southern California, so maybe they have some answers or maybe it's a question. Um, so Linda Sheldon says, um, the Secret Educator Network has developed a subgroup focusing on aquaculture and sharing efforts with one another. So there are some community college and aquaculture programs as well. Awesome, thank you, Linda. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, thanks for that, Linda. I think going back to it, um, <clears throat> as far as there's, there's, it's kind of a, it, it, uh, not a fuzzy area, not a gray area, but they kind of overlap as aquaculture literacy or education and workforce development. So we're looking through the lens of the industry on their needs and what needs, we've mentioned this, what really we do have a, a need to identify the needs of the industry. Uh, but, but one of the thing, one of the obvious uh, missing factors is uh, as far as workforce development is what community college, 
community colleges can train through a one or two year program to focus on, they can focus on, on trades along with biology on that. So it's a, that's something I think will we'll, uh, expand in the future as far as um, aquaculture literacy and, and workforce development, the role of community colleges. Um, while a couple of other people are chatting, I actually have a quick question. Oh, and Linda says there are also partners who provide tours of aquaculture sites, including the centers. So oh, there's yeah. more That's to powerful. And taking somebody out and showing them a farm is unbelievably persuasive. Yeah, but that's a big part of a lot of the mini grants are yeah. going to be doing things like that. Um, so I had a quick question. I guess you mentioned, you know, how you try to align with the executive uh, branch and what the, the presidential administrative priorities. And so a big priority is obviously uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice this year. I know in our office, we're incorporating a lot that into all of our programs even more. Um, so I was wondering how you all are incorporating kind of those concepts into the aquaculture program and Sea Grant. It's been, that's an excellent question. It's not even something that I can say we are specifically doing in the aquaculture program because it's such an office-wide effort. It's, um, it's coming from the very top of our leadership and um, they've made it a, a major priority across all four of focus areas. So there isn't anything that they're doing specific to aquaculture in terms of how Sea Grant's national office operates. It's just you know, making it a priority to, um, to include the, that in, in everything that the national office does. Um, so that includes things that we that Chuck and I talk about and things that we do, um, you know, it's things like, um, looking at who we include in review panels, right? Um, which perspectives are we getting on review panels to look at grants that are coming in? Um, what are the criteria for submitting proposals to the national office? You know, um, it's not as important to me that you have credentials after your name as it is that you have a strong and solid perspective about what the work you're proposing is going to do uh, for the community that you're targeting, for the place that you're, you're planning on doing your work. So. Generally, and, and not in a formal way, but trying not to be stuck in, in some of the same old habits and patterns about how we decide what to fund or, or what to what to prioritize. For sure. Thanks. Um, and then Heather added a note about kind of going back to the question before that was Maine Sea Grant works with other partners in the state to provide an aquaculture training program and community college programs are under development. Uh, Maggie, something that just popped into my head that I, I forgot to mention was in the, and I just don't, I don't remember exactly where this language was. I believe it was actually in congressional language, not the president's budget language, but um, we'll, we are going to be specifically tasked with partnering with HBCUs, um, which is you know, really, really exciting. Um, it's, but I, I don't think that came from executive language. I think it actually came from congressional language, which means that it's going to be, you know, practically implemented, not something we've got to kind of go back and say, is there room to include this, right? That's something that we are uh, going to strictly adhere to. Yeah, that's great. Um, so Doug asks, how is aquaculture literacy assessed through K through 12 or non-formal education, like through awareness, knowledge, understanding? That's a really good question. It's, it's, in a lot of ways, it's project by project, right? So if a proposal comes in and, and gets funded, that's going to be something we look at um, in terms of how they evaluate their work once it's done. Um, we do have um, you know, processes in place at the national office to study the impacts and accomplishments of projects. Um, but I, I don't know that I'm – I think we could do a better job at the national level with those types of measures, um, assessing something like that where – you are applying the curriculum at a K through 12 level, and it's probably going to have impacts for a long time afterwards. Um, you know, we we don't. I think we could do a better job of that kind of evaluation, and a lot of it has to get done in the front end, right? You've got to set it up so that you're actually collecting the right data that you need to do that kind of evaluation. Um, I think that's an area that we could improve on. But, yeah, but on the project, project level, yeah, a lot of those a lot of those are done by the the projects themselves. It'd be yeah, it'd be um, a different tiered assessment, I would suppose, as far as you could have measures on, on um, 
students, K to 12 students that, that wind up in an aquaculture program at a community college or a four-year college or, or, go, or go to work on an aquaculture farm or just simple awareness. And so those, are, again, are those are the targets. We don't, we don't expect everybody to, to join the aquaculture industry, but we are, we're also trying to um, increase the liter literacy of potential future consumers of seafood. So that, it's a two-pronged effort there. Right, and Heather says consumer awareness studies can be useful to understand the public's familiarity with aquaculture. You're absolutely right. I, I would be really curious to see if anything that we funded over the years has actually affected behavior change. You know, does somebody come up to a seafood case and make a different choice based on what they learned in, um, through one of the curriculums that were, were funded by Seager? Awesome, yeah. Yeah, Heather, Heather does say yeah, project by project, so. Yeah, they're just like, yeah, pre, pre and post surveys. <laughs> Assessing so ocean literacy is centered around the essential principles and concepts. Yeah, a couple other people typing now too. Linda just says, exciting time to look at building out aquaculture literacy and assessment. Yeah, in fact, Linda, I, I would say it's an exciting time to look at building out assessment, not just in literacy, but across all of our projects. I think we, that's, that type of longer term and deeper evaluation is something we need to be better at. And um, there's a lot of support for it. Yeah, yeah maybe de define principles and concepts for seafood resources assessment, like there is, I guess, for ocean literacy, kind of with their principles and concepts that you can... Yeah, exactly. So you got to know what to ask at the beginning so that you collect it along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was saying Brown is typing, but I feel like, yeah, Brown might have some good insight from the projects mm -hmm. that are funded now, and we'll see some results yeah. from them when they're, when they're finished. Yeah, so um, I guess two things. That's a, a timely comment because Christos, who it is my supervisor and I had our kind of evaluation of the aquaculture literacy position a couple of days ago and Mark joined us and we talked about kind of sitting down and, and really defining what aquaculture literacy is so that we can shape, um, you know, calls for proposals as well as um, future activities and ways that we evaluate that those activities based off of the definitions that we come up with as a team. So. The, the, that would be a concept that we all sit together as, as NOAA, not just as Office of Education, Sea Grant, Office of Aquaculture, but we all sit down it and think about uh, the guardrails of what aquaculture literacy means. Um, I will say Linda Chilton's on here. She's got, and I think I saw Mackenzie Nelson on here too. They've got um, a great project at Aquarium of the Pacific that's assessing how children ages three, three to eight um, learn about seaweed farming using play-based activities. Um, there is a great um, new game called Tiny Seas that is in development right now that's geared towards, um, I think, middle school aged kids to um, teach them how to, uh, you know, through a video game, uh, run a farm. And I think that there are, are metrics in place to evaluate how uh, those kids are learning. And then um, we have a few other projects with the aquaculture literacy mini grants that are um, planning to kind of evaluate what audiences they reach and um, kind of the, the level of engagement that those audiences have throughout the program. Um, and I think I can put into the chat the summary um, page for all of the 10 projects that are, are being funded for this year, but they just, just started. They're And I know we'll probably have some webinars and panels on these when they wrap up. It'll be really interesting to hear. Um, and Terry asks, um, so the issue of feed that's distributed has been controversial. So is this still as much of an issue and is there any exploration of utilizing a plant-based diet? Yeah, that's an excellent question. There, there's been, sorry, Chuck. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's been, well, no, that's, I'm sorry too, but I'll, I'll, I think we can tag team an answer on this one for sure. Um, there's been a lot of research in, in recent years um, 
a lot of it's been focused on more omnivorous species such as channel catfish about um, reducing the amount of fish meal uh, going into that and so really there's no there's not a requirement for fish meal there's diets that have been developed for that species but that's an interest of, of more carnivorous more uh, that are popular in, in <clears throat> marine finfish aquaculture or popular species of marine finfish aquaculture uh, so that's that's one area that that uh, folks are looking at as far as research um, Mark do you have anything to add about your yeah, experience absolutely. with uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the most popular farm fish in the world have had really dramatic improvements in feed conversion ratios, meaning how much, how many pounds of feed you have to feed to the animal in order to get a pound of, you know, of fish fillet or fish meat out of it at the other end of the production cycle. Um, and so, you know, some of these things are really remarkable. But the feed conversion ratio for salmon is pretty close to one to one. You know, nothing can ever be one to one. I don't think, um, at least not convincingly. But um, the the understanding and perception of, of how um, how problematic feed resources can be when it comes to feeding uh, fish on a farm, and the reality of how um, how much work and improvement has gone into feeds over the last 40 or 50 years are so widely split. It's almost I don't really don't understand it, frankly. Um, th that should be a huge headline and a huge story, and they should be really proud of all that work because it's been tremendous, and there's been a lot of improvement. That, that doesn't mean you still have to feed responsibly and carefully, and you've got to have good farm design and good really, really important to have good farm siting and, and a good location um, so that you, um, you know, so that you minimize any kind of other impact just from having food added to the water. But like Chuck said, you know, some, some of these omnivorous fish um, can be raised on nearly vegetarian diets. Uh, in, in some cases, um, the, the, the requirement for having a carnivorous or an omnivorous fish eat, uh, you know, a fish-based diet, a, a, you know, a fish meal-based diet or fish oil diet, um, still exists in some way because it impacts so strongly the, the ultimate flavor and quality of that product. Um, so there's been a little bit of work lately on raising animals on, uh, on a plant-based diet that's nutritionally complete. Um, you know, it might have to have vitamins and things added to it. But you can get a fish from egg up to just pretty close to being able to go to market, and then you can finish it on a diet that's got um, you know, animal protein in it, that's got fish, uh, fish meal in it, so that you get the color of the flesh that you're looking for and the flavor that the customer is looking for. Um, that's a really, really interesting approach, too, um, because it would dramatically cut down on the total need, um, and it would just use it at the very end when it's, when it's kind of critically important to get the, the product looking perfect uh, before it goes off to be sold at the market. Thank you, Chuck, or, and Mark, <laughs> both of you. <laughs> um. I see things slowing down a little bit in the chat. I'll hand it back over to Maggie. Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say, I um, really appreciate everyone's comments. I think this was great. And, um, you know, again, if you wanna revisit any of these comments or the presentation, it will be available soon. Um, so we have a few minutes left and I'll, I'll start wrapping up, but if anyone has any last questions, you know, please feel free to type them in the chat. Of course, you can also email Chuck and Mark on this, um, with any follow-up questions or anything like that. Um, if you think of something later, um, but I'm not seeing any, any chat, any questions in the chat. Um, so I'm going to just bring it to a close. Um, we, these webinars work quarterly for a while. They've been a little more sporadic with everything that's been going on, but we will hopefully have one in the, you know, late fall or winter again. I know we have one actually lined up sometime in the winter. So look for that. If you're not on the listserv and you'd like to be, um, to stay up to date with that, please email me, um, and I am happy to add you. You really only get emails pertaining to this webinar uh, webinar series if you'd like, so it's not a lot of emails. Um, but with that, I will close us out and um, thank you all. Thank you, Mark and Chuck, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Hope you have a good rest of your week and long- Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.